Hello and welcome to Freedom Fest TV. I'm Gina Carr, the producer of Freedom Fest TV, and I am so glad that you could join us today. If you would, over in the chat, just let us know who you are, where you're uh, coming in from today, and you know what your connection is to Ross and your uh, interest in, in his case and interest in what's going on with him. We'd appreciate that very much. Today is brought to you by Freedom Fest. It's a fantastic, uh, it's a fantastic event about freedom and it's gonna be held in Las Vegas as always. And this is year number nine. We'll be holding that in the middle of July, July 13th through the 16th. You can go to freedomfest.com and enter the code FFTV, all caps, to get $100 off your registration. It's gonna be fantastic. Our guest today is going to be speaking. Our MC, who is also the host today, is uh, the MC of Freedom Fest is the host today, and I'm gonna introduce him at this time. So he is Terry Brock. He's an internationally recognized speaker. He's a member of the Nas National Speakers Association Hall of Fame, speaks all around the world about technology and marketing, the former chief enterprise blogger for Skype and the editor-in-chief of AT&T's big business blog, an award-winning blog. And so he knows people all around the planet and today he's gonna get to know our special guest much better. Take it away, Terry. Well, thank you very much, Gina, and welcome aboard, everyone. We are going to have a fabulous time today uh, for a cause that is extraordinarily important to so many of us, and we are going to be able to talk about something that is going to be relevant, not just in this situation, but I want you to think about how this is important to you. Yes, you personally, because we're human beings and we see what's happening. So we're going to have some in-depth, roll up your sleeves kind of uh, work. And the nice thing about it today with Freedom Fest TV, we're using a technology so that we can really go in depth. This is not just a one way. For those of you that are joining us live right now, you will be able to come on screen. You'll be able to come on board, screen talk. We'll see you on screen. Kind of like you never go to those meetings, you know, where somebody is uh, talking on the stage and you've got a mic out in the middle of the audience. People line up at the microphone and they ask questions. That's kind of what we're doing right now using this technology called Blab. That's B-L-A-B, -B, Blab at Blab.im. And uh, we're using that. You can use it too. It's a marvelous little tool. So uh, that's kind of the technology we're using. But the more important thing, is the person that we are talking to today. As you can see on the screen right now is Lynn Albrecht, and she is just a marvelous person. I've known her for a few days now, known her from a distance for quite a while, and just admire her enormously. She is the mother of Ross Albrecht, who is the creator of the Silk Road website. Ross received double life sentence without parole for all nonviolent charges. At sentencing, the judge said this was to serve as a warning to others and called Silk Road's libertarian in philosophy, troubling and dangerous. That's in quotes, by the way. Ross has appealed his excessive sentence, as well as important trial issues, including, get this, suppressed evidence, blocked defense witnesses, and curtailed cross-examination. Since Ross's arrest, Lynn has strived to direct awareness beyond the sensationalism of the case to the important precedents and issues at stake and how they impact our freedoms in the digital age. This is extraordinarily important as we're seeing more and more of our work and our life being devoted in the digital realm. We know this can affect all of us. So it's not just something happening to another person. Like I said before, this is relevant to us. Through these efforts, she has become known as an advocate for constitutional protections, individual freedom, and privacy. Lynn has spoken at numerous events, both in the U.S. and Europe, appeared on a range of TV and radio podcasts, including Reason TV, CNN, Huffington Post, Live, and Fox, and conducted many interviews with, well, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Forbes, The Guardian, and others. And when not working to raise awareness, Lynn focuses on raising funds for Ross's appeal. Now, write this down. We're going to mention this throughout. Matter of fact, Gina, if you could, please put this link into the chat so people will be able to reference it. www.freeross.org. That's F-R-E-E-R-O-S-S dot org. Freeross.org. We'll be putting uh, that for in many different places. Well, Lynn, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. And I really want to thank Freedom Fest, too, because um, it's such an honor to be uh, going there and speaking about this. And um, the movie, the documentary Deep Web, which mm. is not only about Ross, but can't see wide across the screen. It's like, ah. But anyway, That's I'm it. in it. And uh, <laughs> uh, but it's it's a it's it raises a lot of questions and really is very educational 
it only goes through the trial. And of course, there's been a whole lot more since the trial, the revelation of uh, corruption, the barbaric sentence, and more. And uh, I will be there uh, as part of a Q&A to talk a little bit about that as well. So it's really an opportunity i so appreciative of having. Oh, well, we're glad to have you here. So now for those that are watching this and haven't heard of it or heard just a little bit, or maybe they heard one thing which might be a little different, that's why we've got you on board, Len. Please give us, yeah. first of all, a capsule of what has happened, what has happened up to now. And then, of course, after that, I want to ask you where we are today, kind of an update. I understand, didn't you see Ross yesterday? I saw him Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. So or within yeah. just a few days, those of you that are watching this yeah. via recording, uh, you'll understand we're seeing this uh, contemporary for us right now, but uh, always can be uh, in tune with what's the update. So Lynn, uh, can you give us kind of a Reader's Digest version, a capsule of what has happened? What was Silk Road? What was Ross's involvement? And where mm -hmm. what happened with the trial? Where is he now? Kind of give us an update on that, please. Okay. Um, well, I don't have any inside in so um, I don't have attorney client privilege or any of that. Mm -hmm. I was at trial every single day and a sentencing. So Silk Road, from what I understand, was an open free market place that operated anonymously through the Tor network and only used cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, to um, for people to pay. So you had to open a Bitcoin account. You had to know how to use Tor. Um, and Think certain things were not allowed. So it wasn't a totally free market for things that Silk Road administration said would hurt others. For instance, there it was no child pornography. There were no assassinations. There was no stolen property. And there's other things, um, despite what much of the media says, um, you know, they lump everything together. Um, now, drugs were allowed. Um, and that was based on what many libertarians believe is that it's an individual choice. Um, and I really want to be clear. I'm not defending Silk Road and I'm not defending the things that were on Silk Road. Many of them, there were legal things as well, by the way, there were books and art and, um, lots of different legal things, but it, it, it eventually was mostly drugs, I think, because of the anonymous aspect of it, um, the legal things were not allowed to be mentioned at trial. Ross's libertarian philosophy was not allowed to be mentioned at trial. There was a very strict narrative that um, was presented to the jury. And um, so it was a very limited picture. Um, but in any case, um, yeah, so the site, the government was investigating it. How they found the Silk Road server remains to be seen um, because many experts have said they absolutely do not believe uh, FBI agent Tarbell's explanation of how he found the server. They said it's gibberish. It doesn't make any sense. This is an explanation he gave under oath. And um, we want the defense wanted an evidentiary hearing to explore this, and that was not permitted. Um, and actually, he didn't even show up at trial for cross-examination. However, um, uh, they did get the server one way or the other, and that, um, some people say, was hacking. And that's a whole other question we can go into. But um, in any case, they controlled the site for several months and then um, arrested Ross, which is a whole other question how they found Ross or targeted him, um, which, you know, we can go into as well. But um, in any case, um, he was arrested. He was um, immediately put in solitary confinement for six weeks with no explanation at all. Uh, and since then, he has this was in October October 1st of 2013. And he's been in prison ever since. Um, he's been a model prisoner. He uh, tutors fellow inmates, helping them get college, get into college, um, you know, from a remote course. Um, also uh, getting their GED high school diploma. He, you know, he's been a real contribution. And I've, I've had guards even tell me that. Um, and um, he's a wait. So he, we went through this trial which we can talk about. And that's really the big issue here is if we don't have fair trials in this country, I would suggest we are not a free country. Mm -hmm. And I feel like every trial that is not fair and is allowed to stand brings us that much closer to tyranny. Um, it's very concerning. And there was a, the appeal itself, which we are now in the appeal. Uh, it was filed January 12th and the government will be responding to the appeal 
um, in a couple of weeks, June 17th. And then the um, defense has an opportunity to rebut that. But it, the appeal is over twice the length of a normal appeal. They had to get special permission from the court to submit it. There was so much. And the lawyers told me that wasn't all. They just couldn't, space wouldn't allow for all of the violations that were at, at trial and the investigation. Hmm. But the points that it brings up, the main points, and we can talk about those, I think they're very important, are put us all in peril, I think. And especially, as you mentioned, going into the digital age. Um, there's Things are very fluid in the courts right now because we've we're making this transition from the 20th century uh, to the 21st and, dig and digital material. And there's a lot of question about, well, is the Fourth Amendment even applicable anymore? Are we giving up our right to privacy through the Fourth Amendment being basically trampled on and um, other issues because it's digital? And so things are in flux. There's a lot of different, um, not only Ross's case, but other cases before the courts. And things are being determined now that will impact all of us going forward. Um, precedent will be set. And um, so it's a, it's a big it's a big issue. It's not this is not a drug case. In my opinion, it's it's of course drugs are part of it, the drug war is part of it, but I feel like that's somewhat of a distraction. It's been a distraction. It's very sensationalistic, and what's behind it, I think, is is actually much more of concern. Yes, and in fact, I mean, we can address that. One of the things we want to talk about is this is more than just one a person who has uh, been arrested and now in prison. There's a whole lot more, and the ramifications are enormous for all of us. In the digital age, a lot of this is uh, un unknown. As we know, technology often leads law. You are a lawyer, Lynn, and you know about this much more than I do. I'm not a lawyer, but we see that often I'm technology... <laughs> Oh, you're not. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. But uh, we see the kind of uh, precedent that it's setting is enormous. And uh, what I want to do is talk with you about that. And we want to uh, uh, bring that in. We've got some people waiting that have questions. And so we definitely want you to ask those questions in just a moment. Right now, what I want to do is I want to play a little clip. We tested this before and it worked fine. And maybe have you comment on this. This is a presentation that you gave recently to a meeting up in New Hampshire. And you talked about what happened. It's about a three minute, 40 some second uh, video. And I'd like to uh, take a look at that and then have you com comment on that if that's all right with you. Yeah. Okay, so here we go, Gina. We're going to bring that in and uh, we want to make sure that this is uh, showing just right. Whoops, uh, let's see. There we go. It's coming on the screen right now. This is our YouTube clip. Okay, then at that point, the prosecutor leaps up. Objection, objection. This line of questioning must stop now. We can't go forward in this. And the judge didn't quite get it. She's like, well, why? You know? And she's like, look, I'm here and you're here and you need to show me how we can work this out. And he kept arguing and finally she said, let's stop the cross-examination. Our lawyer had at least another hour to go, he said. Send the jury home early so we can talk about all this. And that's what happened and she said she was doing this in the interest of justice. And so the prosecutor kept arguing and said, look, they, they want to say someone else's DPR. And she's like, well, yeah, that's valid. I mean, what, what else do you do? That's what a defense does. And um, at that point, um, the our attorney said, cited the Brady rule, which is a well-established law that says that anything, any evidence in favor of the defendant cannot be hidden. And the judge agreed. It was Brady. And she went on to say, um, that if an agent, if the agent Dr. Yagen pursued someone other than the defendant, it was highly relevant, and not only that, it was directly relevant. And how he arrived at that conclusion was obviously relevant. The fact that the agent believed there was probable cause to suspect him, clearly relevant. That the agent believed somebody else might be DPR, obviously highly relevant, and um, that an alternate suspect strikes me, her being the judge, as in the heartland of the defense, and the fact that Carpellis could be a DPR had, quote, come out in spades. When the um, prosecutor continued to argue, she said, look, this Carpellis thing, the cat's out of the bag, court's adjourned till next Tuesday. It was a long weekend. 
Well, we come back, and it was like I was in a different courtroom. Um, now we're playing by different rules. All those relevant things, now they were irrelevant. The um, jury was told to forget they ever heard it. The prosecution got a mulligan, and the um, judge set, flagged what should have been objected to and wasn't, so it could be sustained. And very strict boundaries were set going forward as what the um, defense could ask. So, did you suspect Mark Carpellis? That was now off limits. Did you believe Mark Carpellis was DPR? Off limits. Do you suspect that Mark Carpellis operated Silk Road? Off limits. And that offer from the lawyer to provide DPR's name? Well, that's just not relevant. So here's day three versus day four. What a difference a weekend makes. So the cat was back in the bag. And um, the reasoning, you know, this alternate perpetrator thing, that just might confuse the jury. We don't want to do that. And uh, our lawyer said, my, my whole cross-examination and defense, it's eviscerated, or as Forbes' Sarah Jong wrote, completely derailed. Yeah, very, very interesting. Well, as we look at that, uh, and I want to get your comments on this, I'm just recapping, it sounds like, and again, I'm not a legal authority, not a lawyer at all, but Judge uh, Catherine Forrest seemed to have had one opinion on uh, a Friday over that weekend who knows what could have happened? She had a complete change of heart, it seems, on Monday. Uh, Lynn, I don't understand. Please help explain this to me. It sounds confusing. I've got no explanation. All I know is that's what happened. Um, it was a one, total 180. And um, our the defense attorney was muzzled from that time on, uh, mm. with not only with that cross-examination, but other cross-examination. And you know, the jury was told, forget they ever heard it. Um, and it was just erased. And from then on, it was a totally different courtroom. And I was shocked, to be honest. It was one of those moments where you're like, this can't be happening. This, this is the United States of America. We have fair trials. We can, you know, and our lawyer, who's very experienced, he's been doing this for 30 years, said he's never been shut down like he was in that trial. It, wow. It was... And that's important because, like you said, in the digital age, what ramifications does that have for any of us? Do any of us have a right to that? And we don't know, but it does raise some good questions. And by the way, speaking of questions, we would like to hear from you. We're using technology now so that you could come on board. We have someone standing by right now, Jacqueline Whitmore, who has been patiently waiting to ask a question and uh, want to bring her on board right now. Let's see, with a couple of clicks of the mouse, we can uh, make sure that she comes in there or or maybe not, uh, like, like she might not be there. Jacqueline, if you want to come back on and uh, call in again, we can try that to bring you on. We want to make sure we uh, get that. But while we're waiting for her to come on, uh, I'm really curious, what precedence does this set up for us for the future, in your opinion, Lynn? Yeah. Well, actually, you mentioned the concern for the digital age, and that is one of the precedents because they never brought one live witness who said, I saw Ross Ulbricht do anything. Hire, he hired me. He wrote this. Uh, nothing. There was no live witness. The only live witness said that Ross told him he sold the site. Um, but what they did have was just a mountain of digital evidence, chats, screenshots, that sort of thing. Now, I've been told by experts that digital evidence isn't like physical evidence. It's very vulnerable to being changed, edited, planted, um, rewritten and, um, and other courts have thrown it out because of that. And actually banks won't even, uh, a mortgage companies won't even take a screenshot of a bank statement because they know how easily faked it is. You've got to show them the original. And yet in this courtroom, a man can be put away for life based on this flimsy evidence. And our, and our lawyer said the standard of evidence has been drastically lowered by this case and the precedent. And, you know, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to think, oh, you know, there's no DNA, there's no real witnesses, there's nothing really solid here. 
And if they, if the government, what, what protection do we have from them creating? You know, all you need is computer and Photoshop. These, this evidence, and um, you know, whether you believe it or not, this is a extremely. I mean, I don't, but you know, if you do, it should still be of concern because this is a slippery slope. This is, um, you know, it, this is one of the questions for the digital age. Another oh, yeah. precedent um, here is what's called transferred intent. Transferred intent. Intent. So mm -hmm. it's making one person responsible for the actions of another. So in this case, a website host responsible for the actions of vendors and uh, buyers on his site. And a lot of people have said this is going to put um, you know, a chill on the internet to make website hosts criminally liable. Now, yeah. the transfer intent they've the government has applied to Federal Express. They indicted Federal Express for drug trafficking and money laundering because people used FedEx to transport um, uh, illegal pharmaceuticals. And but I have noticed they have not indicted the United States Postal Service. And Eric Holder himself said that lots of drugs are being sent through that. But in any case, mm. um, they did that to Federal Express. And just an example of how this case, well, we can go into how it's political, but Amazon until 2013 sold cyanide on its site. And uh, tragically, a, a young teenager bought it and killed herself with it. Her mother is actually suing Amazon and the vendor and they don't have it now, but they had it then knowingly. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly the same principle. And I don't see Jeff Bezos in court and I don't think he should be. But my point is making website hosts responsible for things. It has, it has wide implications. Absolutely. So that's another. Yeah, you think That's I'm thinking about with Amazon. I have Prime Amazon and love it. It's a great service. There's lots of things I buy, camera equipment, or I got a, a, a tripod and I might have a monopod. What if I bought something on Amazon and then used it for something illegal? Whatever that might be. Does that mean now that Amazon is liable for that? And if it's delivered via the post office or FedEx, are they liable? I think we're getting into some uh, very questionable area here. And uh, it's something that, uh, as you say, it has some enormous ramifications. Well, yeah, I mean, the hacking charge against Ross, it wasn't because he they said he hacked anybody. Well, they never really said that he um, they didn't say he actually sold drugs or did any of it. It was all about um, hosting a platform. It wasn't about the product itself. It was a platform. Mm. But um, no, but that's absolutely right. And, um, you know, uh, where does liability end? And actually, yeah. the government controlled Silk Road for several months. They kept it open for business. So are they liable too? I mean, just wondering where yeah. do you, where do you end this? And, and, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's of concern, this transferred intent. And like I said, it's making a criminal umbrella way wider than it should be. You know, now I'm not only responsible for what I do, I'm responsible for what others do. And it's, I think it's a very dangerous precedent. Um, it could be abused very easily. Um, another, Another precedent is, um, and this is really of concern in the digital age too, is that uh, the government seized Ross's um, laptop, Facebook, and Gmail accounts with a general warrant. And a general warrant is what we partially what we fought the American Revolution against. It's allow it doesn't particularly describe the target of the warrant. It's just we're going to look through your house from attic to basement and we'll see what we can find. We're going on a fishing expedition and, and we're going to see what we can find. And that's basically what they did with uh, his laptop. Um, this is unconstitutional. The um, National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers is joined by EFF, Electronic Frontier Foundation, in the in amicus brief in the appeal saying this is unconstitutional. And But the government's argument is, well, it's digital. I mean... The Fourth Amendment talks about papers and effects. They don't mention laptops and cell phones. And I'm like, uh, okay, so we are to give up our privacy, give up the Fourth Amendment, because now we keep our lives on, on you know, a laptop instead of in an actual physical file cabinet. Because it was in a physical file cabinet, there'd be no question. And, you know, we all know a laptop is a file cabinet on steroids. It's a mm -hmm. gateway to all kinds of things. And... It's, you know, the principle is obviously applicable and um, they're arguing this. 
So that's huge, huge implications for the digital age. Yes, and indeed. Right. Their implications yes. are enormous, and it uh, is scary when we think about it. Uh, it and you're scary. watching Freedom Fest TV, where we're getting a chance to talk with Lynn Ulbricht. She's the mother of Ross Ulbricht, who is convicted uh, and sentenced to two life prisons with sentences without parole. Very severe, in my mind. That's uh, just short of death, it seems, a death sentence. And uh, doing that because he never did anything that was violent. And he hosted a website. And our concern is, where are we going with that? And we want to hear from you. If you have a question, now would be a good time. We want to hear from you. If you want to just come on, just click on that uh, button that you'll see to call in. And with a couple of clicks of the button over here, we can bring you on the screen. So if you would like to ask a question to Lynn, we'll be there to uh, uh, help you. We want to hear from you on this. And Lynn, I want to ask you how we got here. You've learned a lot now about the criminal justice system, the prison you're seeing, Russ. How you were there just Wednesday. How is he doing? How is Ross doing now? And what are your insights and thoughts updated now from your personal experience about the criminal justice system in the United States today? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. Let me just quickly, and I want to go into a, there's a few more precedents I just want to touch on real fast. Okay, please. Um, the Fifth and Sixth Amendments, you have a right to present a defense in a trial. His those due process rights for Ross were violated. He was not able to present an adequate defense. Um, there's the whole thing I touched on before. Is the United States government allowed to hack into a foreign server without a warrant? They did not have a warrant um, for the Icelandic server, Silk Road server. There's a whole other issue of the First Amendment that was brought up in sentencing. And maybe, well, I'll just say it real quick. You mentioned that the judge referenced his libertarian beliefs and the site's libertarian, um, you know, uh, philosophy. And they said, you know, um, this is troubling and dangerous. And this is a woman whose job is to protect our First Amendment rights and especially political speech. Political speech is sacrosanct. You should be able to say anything politically that you want. And for her, the, the phrase she singled out was, DPR saying the government was the enemy. I've taken a little informal poll around various conferences. Do you think the government's the enemy? There's a lot of people who do. Are we all going to be thrown into prison for this or does it going to magnify a, a sentence? And, um, you know, I thought the founding fathers thought we were supposed to be skeptical of the government, not think of it as our friend and benefactor. Um, another terrible, of course, um, precedent is the draconian sentencing. And we can talk more about that if you like. But um, to have this out of proportion sentence, this opens the way for other nonviolent people to have basically a death sentence in disguise. This is a huge, um, to me, um, overstepping of government power and abuse of it. Uh, and uh, they never gave any reason for it. And the Sentencing um, Reform Act requires that you don't give a sentence that's, it, you should give a sentence that's sufficient, but no longer than necessary. They never said why it was necessary. And then there's the Sixth Amendment on fair trials. So that's, you know, those are some of the precedents that, and why it's such an important case for all of us. As regards the um, prison and the criminal justice system, uh, frankly, I didn't really pay a lot of attention to it before this. Honestly, a couple, sometimes, like I really did think the mandatory minimums were unconstitutional, but I have had a really eye-opening um, uh, two years, and I'm very dismayed at what how I see the government operating here. The drug war um, is is an abomination. It's been um, actually I have some. Uh, let's see, we've spent 18, 51, Excuse me, no, a billion, fifty-one billion. I'm looking at my notes um, annually over f uh, forty years. Wow, this is our money. To um, that's off the Drug Policy Alliance, uh, who wrote an amicus brief as well, um, website. Um, and no one, do you think anyone else has anyone stopped using drugs? Because I don't think so. It it's doesn't not seem working. to be working very well. It looks about yeah. as effective as prohibition was. Yeah. And it, it, in fact, it's growing cartels and it's, it's, it's ruining lives. I mean, I go to the prison and, you know, we get to know each other, the families and stuff. And, it is heartbreaking. And one woman said, you know, my kids were getting straight A's until this happened and now I'm losing control. Another woman, you know, 
same thing. Her kids are really, it's hard for her single mom now um, having her dad in prison. Um, people, parents coming like me, these are nonviolent people. And I just don't understand as Ross said, well, it's kind of old fashioned to st still be putting people in dungeons basically. Can't we think of something else in the 21st century? We have the technology for nonviolent. I mean, I, the violent question is another thing, but certainly for nonviolent, who's was no threat to anyone. An ankle bracelet with GPS and let them go home to their family and maybe do community service or make restitution if that's applicable. But what are they doing there? They're costing tons of money. They're being warehoused and it's just wasting their lives. But of course, there's a lot of money being made. And the drug war uh, looks to me like it's more about government expansion, trampling on our rights and expanding the prison, prison industrial complex where there's a lot of money involved. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just saw a, 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 an article saying that the um, prison guards union or group is fighting marijuana legalization. And I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, it might cut down on the inventory. And yeah, to me, I if when we're... people are in inventory, it's human trafficking. If you're making money off of human beings as inventory, I, I call it human trafficking. Absolutely. And, and we're seeing that change quite a bit. Uh, uh, and the, the oppression that is there is uh, really uh, draconian. And Gina Carr is uh, joining us, our producer here on screen. Gina, what, can, uh, what uh, comments do you have on this? Yeah, I have a question about this particular topic. Um, in general, I'm very, I'm always for privatization. I'm not for bigger government. Uh, and so at the Libertarian Convention, I was kind of surprised to hear people criticizing, uh, I think, Governor Gary Johnson in Arizona, in, in New Mexico, he had privatized the prisons. And so their point was, oh, he just helps these people make a lot more money because he privatized the prisons. And I'm like, well, that's a libertarian principle. You want to privatize the airports and the um, the trains and all of those things are gonna run better, cheaper, faster. Um, and so I am in favor of privatizing the prisons, but I'm not in favor of creating a, go a government industrial prison complex. So what are your thoughts on that, Lynn? Yeah, I understand your point because it, usually the private sector is so much better and efficient and cost-effective. I think you have to keep the product in mind. These are human beings. 60% mm. now are nonviolent in the prisons. And and by the way, just as an aside, two and a half million children have an incarcerated parent now in this country. So, wow. But see, the thing is when it's private, well, when, both. I think the government has an incentive as well, but it's private. There's an incentive to have more product, to make more money. In this case, it's more people. And so, uh, you know, it's all to the you know lobbyists who are lobbying against the drug uh, laws being changed, for example, because it's in their interest. So I think in this case, and I, I totally get what you're saying, because I kind of felt that way too at first. I thought, well, it's better. And I feel like you have to keep in mind that private industry is not always good in, in cases like this, that they will work to profit and the profits off of human beings and causing incredible amount of misery. So um, you know, I understand both arguments, but, um, the other thing interesting is they now prosecutors and judges can buy stock in these private prisons. To me, that is an absolute conflict of interest. And, oh my gosh. Um, yeah. That's what I was told. I have, I have read about it and, um, yeah, they're allowed to do that. And sometimes it's through mutual funds or whatever, but they are allowed to profit from private prisons. And so, yeah, I think there's a there's a little nuance in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, like throughout it. this entire interview, I've been out here. Uh, I'm glad my camera wasn't on because my jaw's just been dropping. Uh, you know, I've I've heard uh, a lot about Ross's case before, but to hear it straight from you and to hear your perspective and you know more clearly what exactly happened and and to hear it for the you know again and. It's just amazing the different rights that were violated and, and how tragic all of this is. Mm -hmm. I think it's very yeah. You know, another thing I want to ask you, Lynn, is a lot of... Go ahead, Jana. Go ahead, Terry. 
Oh, one thing Lynn, I was going to ask you is uh, recently uh, we saw Edward Snowden was able to speak to the uh, gathering for the Free State Project in New Hampshire. And he was asked a question about NSA, the National Security Agency, and their involvement in uh, Ross's case. And he said that he felt very strongly that they had been involved in that uh, international. And you think, wait a minute, something really interesting is going on. As I start throwing pieces together here, I just come up with, I don't understand, but I'd want to get your perspective that the judge said one thing on Friday after a weekend, and who knows what kind of talk she had with people. Monday, it was a complete 180. Now we're hearing that uh, NSA might have been involved in that and around there, the National Security Agency, and it has ramifications internationally. Uh, what do you make of all of that? What are the potential uh, challenges and problems that you see from the, all of those? Yeah, uh, he said it was unthinkable that they weren't involved. Mm -hmm. yes, um, and I think coming from him, he knows what he's talking about. Um, uh, from what I understand, the NSA does spy on our citizens, that they provide law enforcement and the Drug Enforcement Agency with information illegally and then they create something called parallel construction, which is another story to explain how they, wow, we found these IDs, or wow, uh, this happened. Wow, we found the server. Um, how about that? No one can. And um, so our attorney actually brought up the NSA in some of the motions. The government actually never denied it. What they did was they mocked him and said, oh, the boogeyman of the NSA. Oh, I'm like, you never said no. You never said it wasn't involved, which I thought was sort of interesting. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know uh, anything, excuse me, for sure, but um, it's I, I have read many places that this is done. And um, there's a lot about the case that I'm like, this just doesn't ring true to me. But, you know, that's me. Mm. Uh, I think a lot of people feel that way. Um, yeah. So I think so. And Lynn, you are not and alone. Illegal. As a matter of fact, I want to take... Yeah. I'm sorry. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Sorry. I was just saying it's illegal and it's scary that secretly this agency is spying on citizens. Yeah. When you when think I about grew up, we didn't fear that we didn't have, they didn't have the technology, but it was like people fear the government. Now I run into it all the time. Yeah. And, and what was it? Thomas Jefferson said that when the government uh, or when the people fear the government, it is tyranny. And when the government fears yeah. the people, it's freedom, which what Thomas exactly. Jefferson said. And although he was not one of the founders, the founders of the Constitution, uh, the Republic that we have uh, did go along with that idea. And so we see that it's changed quite a bit right now. And um, I just want you to know that on behalf of uh, Freedom Fest team, Freedom Fest TV and many, many other people, Lynn, we are with you and with Ross. And we would want you wow, to please cool. let Ross know that he is not alone. We're with him. We're standing with him on this and we want to do what we can. We want to be able to uh, move forward on this. And really, we only want peace. We want freedom. We want people to do what they want to do without harming anyone else, nonviolent existence and living. And that's uh, what we're looking for. My question to you is, given everything that's happened right now, it can be really frustrating. And we feel, oh, this is terrible. What can we do to help out you, to help out Ross at this point, and given everything that is happening? Well, unfortunately, in our country, um, fighting for justice is unbelievably crushingly expensive. Um, we got a bill, not even from the lawyers, which I won't even go into what we're in debt to them for. Um, it's a lot, a lot. And they're not quitting, which is I handed to them. But we owe them a ton of money. And, we, and we've had a lot of help up till now. We've gotten us this far, but it's, it never ends. The, the, the expenses keep coming. And we're just one family. Um, we're not rich. We're a lot less rich than we are. We're not, we're not a wealthy you know, family. Um, I got one bill from a company, and their job is to put the appeal in book form bound for the judges to read and give them a digital copy. And it was over $13,000 for that. Wow. Yeah. I said, well, more. Even. I said, what are these covers made of gold or what? You know, I mean, yeah. and if you don't do it, if you do it yourself and try to format it and you make a mistake, we were told that they have been known to throw out a case. It's the whole thing. There's a whole sub industry serving this whole machine that, I mean, expert witnesses and just on and on and on. I mean, just 
pathologists who we had to uh, hire to counter the government's um, uh, presence at sentencing and what they said, which wasn't even part of the trial. Different things. It all costs a lot of money. So we need money. <laughs> we have several different, you can go to freeross.org. There's ways to just straight out donate. If you listen to audiobooks, um, a very generous person donated uh, codes that you can, for certain different levels of donation, you get a certain number of audiobooks off Audible, really good ones. Um, we have art, uh, Ross came up with an art project that we inst instigated. We, you know, he gave us the idea and um, the art was by him. And it was kind of, it, we're going to do another one where um, his art was under a, a screen. So you couldn't see it until you, it was on a grid. And so people would buy, let's say, a square of the grid for a dollar. And so it was like a revealing the picture over time. And um, we, it was really great. And we're going to auction the original and um, we have posters and that sort of thing. It's Ross's uh, view of the trial. It's quite unique. It's uh, if you mm -hmm. go to play the art game with Ross on our uh, homepage, you'll see the, the, um, the art. It's pretty unique. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And he's doing another one completely different. So that's another thing. A woman is hiking the Appalachian trail to be sponsored uh, for uh, Ross and we now have a, um, a 501c3 that's dedicated to the defense of American prisoners and including Ross's appeal. So you can give tax deductibly to um, help us. Um, so there's, we're trying to come up with different options for different people. But in addition, you know, um, it, just contacts, you know, I work constantly and I'm just me and I'm had to learn a ton of stuff and people have stepped up to help. It's been great. But we always need help. We need, you know, I'm not particularly, as you could tell from our uh, warm up today, particularly <laughs> technically brilliant, but also, um, you know, just media and sharing it and, you know, following us and all that, just the attention and contacts, advice, you know. So if you email from our website, I will see that email, I, you know, and it, that's also very helpful. And people who've come up with ideas, like the woman hiking the trail, she goes, I want to do this for Ross. I'm like, great, because I don't always think of things. Another cool mm -hmm. thing that came up um, it's not, it, is that I'm going to do a digital speaking tour uh, when campuses go back to school in the fall, where we're going to, through, and I'm working with Students for Liberty and Students for a Sensible Drug Policy to organize their chapters and others at different campuses to show Deep Web, and then I'm going to Skype in with a Q and A and Alex Winter just told me he, if he can, depending on the dates, he's going to Skype in too. So that should be a really interesting, um, you know, thing. And um, so anyway, we're just kind of different ways to raise awareness. All of that's helpful. You know, we welcome any help because again, they're rich and they're huge and they're, they're relentless, this government when, and it, it's, um, Gosh, the stories Ross tells me of, of people he knows in there. And it's hard. It breaks your heart. It's just horrible. And yes, um, it, does. it really is. And, you know, for me now, these people are not statistics. I mean, it's horrible statistics, you know, um, and the United States leads the world in the incarceration rate, which is a disgrace for, for our free country, quote unquote. But um, they're not statistics to me. anyway. I'm one of them. And, and so are the other people. They're human beings with and they're all suffering and, you know, it, it's, it, it could be done so much more fair mainly and more constructively. I mean, I think of these two and a half million children who are very much impacted by incarcerated nonviolent parents, mostly from the drug war, the nonviolent ones. And it's like, what about them? What, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it's hurting so many people. And um, yes. so, that's what I've yeah, had my eyes on. Yeah. yeah, very good points that you raised there. And uh, it seems very down, but yet at the same time, and I want to get your comments on this, I see a ray of hope potentially. Yeah. And I'd want to find out what you think about with it, that as we look at the possibilities, we see Colorado, Washington State that have rec uh, legalized recreational use of drugs. Not that uh, all of us want to take it. I mean, for me personally, right. yeah. I've never had marijuana. It's just in my life. But I feel that when we look at the incarceration and the, the problems, the human cost that's there, we could see a trend moving that direction. We're in an election year right now. 
many states have on the ballot the legalization of marijuana, medical marijuana and others. And we could be moving in that direction. It seems like there is a possibility, some hope that could be there. Not that we necessarily want to have everyone taking any drug they want. What we want is more freedom. We want to be able to see how things can turn around. What are your thoughts on that as we look at the political situation now before the election with the possibilities of maybe some uh, repudiation of some of these laws? Well, of course, I'm, every time I hear or read about that, it gives me hope. Um, actually, Gary Johnson told me personally he would pardon Ross, and so Whoa. did uh, John McAfee. In fact, we have a video of John McAfee saying that um, up on the web. But um, so the libertarians get it. Um, because, no, I don't advocate drug use. Don't do them, okay, guys? Just stop doing drugs, okay? Yeah. But to throw people <laughs> to the punishment, it's part of our Constitution. The punishment fits the crime. It's not supposed to be so out of proportion. And of course, in Ross's case, it's beyond that. It's so ridiculous. But um, that's the problem. And I'm not advocating drug use at all. Neither are you. That right. it's, it's very confusing, I think, for people. They kind of get it, um, and a lot of conservatives, they get it mixed up. Because it's really, the drug war is about government intrusion and expansion. That's what the drug war is about. It's, mm -hmm. I don't believe it's about drugs at all. And one of the points... Just to say, what well, one thing that really opened my eyes was I realized people say he's Ross a political prisoner. I'm like, well, that's kind of hyperbolic. I don't want to, you know. No, I do believe that now because mm. after seeing the sentences for the other drug offenders in this case, for example, the um, biggest drug dealer, convicted drug dealer on Silk Road, ten years, he sold mountains of drugs. The biggest cocaine and heroin dealer five years. One of the top admins during the height of Silk Road, 17 months. And then Ross gets double life without parole for being an admin and creator. And it's obviously not about drugs. And the, the two corrupt agents, which we haven't even talked about, the suppressed evidence, but they got six and seven years and they we don't know how much they did on that site. We don't, they had absolute unfettered access to the Silk Road server and site. They could change anything. They could access yep. computer experts and they used it to steal over a million dollars. But, and they're in prison now. Um, but it's tainted. It, a lot of people are saying, well, that evidence is tainted. We don't know who wrote what. It's all anonymous. It's all chats. And that was not allowed to be heard by the jury. The um, prosecution fought and the judge accepted that this would not be mentioned in front of the jury. This is a this is the Brady rule, which I referenced in um, that clip. Well, it yes. also applies here. This is exculpatory evidence favorable to Ross that was not permit. You know, what if the, if the jury knew there were these two corrupt agents with freewheeling, unfettered keys to the kingdom to do anything they wanted? Maybe that would have cast reasonable doubt that he was the one and only ruthless kingpin, blah, blah, blah. But um, they weren't allowed to know about it. They didn't even know their names. Mm -hmm. That's a big part of the appeal. That's that's yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> Makes it and apparently it's an epidemic. This prosecutorial abuse of the Brady rule. Judge uh, Alex Kaczynski of the Ninth Circuit has written extensively about it. He's like, these prosecutors are breaking the Brady rule all over the place to win their cases. They don't want that evidence to be known. This is outrageous. Yeah. It is. That's why, again, as we've said before, this case is not about just this case. It is about the ramifications of how it can be for any of us, for anything that we might do in the future and where we're going as a republic and where it stands. And so Absolutely. it's all very, very important as we see uh, where we are and uh, what's happening with it. And uh, you're watching Freedom Fest TV. Uh, and we're getting a chance to find out what's going on, not only with Russ Albrecht, but through his mother, Lynn Albrecht, who is joining us now about uh, what's happening. And we also have our producer, Gina Carr, joining us right now. Gina, what uh, well, ideas I have, I have and insights do you but have? I do want to remind everybody that uh, this show is sponsored by Freedom Fest. And Freedom Fest will be taking place July 13th mm -hmm. through the 16th in Las Vegas. So get your reservations in. Uh, we're staying at Planet Hollywood. That's where all the events will be. And they have some great roommates right now. And uh, I was just looking online. There's some fantastic mm -hmm. airfares. So, you know, climb on board and join us for Freedom Fest. Freedomfest.com. Use code FFTV, all caps, to get $100 off. 
Now back to Lynn, Lynn, uh, this whole mass incarceration, incarceration nation, all these uh, injustices that have been going on with regard to prisons in the US. It's really bothered me for a long time. And um, so I'm really happy to hear you talking about it. A few questions I have. Number one, have, have you guys been talking at all to the Innocence Project people who do a lot of defense for people who are improperly incarcerated and who there's been a lot of violation of their rights? Are you talking to them at all? You know, I haven't talked to them. I haven't. Um, I think I wrote them, but um, I haven't pushed it. Uh, I didn't hear back. I, I'm not sure even. I I didn't. We we have gotten support from, um, of course, I mentioned the, the amicus briefs about the laptop, but also Drug Policy Alliance wrote an amicus brief, and it was joined by a former federal judge, Nancy Gertner, um, who thought the sentencing was wrong, and uh, as well as Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, Leap and um, just um, Leadership USA, and they all uh, joined this amicus brief. And we've had other groups like um, that. It wasn't the amicus wasn't really appropriate it's in there for their case, but like Families Against Mandatory Minimums is a supporter, and um, there's other groups that are supporting. Um, you know, I may I think it's possible that because Ross is still in appeal, that I think the Innocence Project. I could be wrong. Is is more for people who are have been it's settled and they're in prison. But I could be wrong. I I it's, hmm. I'll take yeah. I'll look into it. It, it might be worth Thanks. looking into. Similarly, I'm really encouraged. Uh, you know, Terry's yeah. talking about uh, some of the things he's encouraged about. I'm also encouraged about. There's um, a lot of citizen activism projects that are going on, and mainly through the podcast venue, which I listen to. Some of those um, serial sort of kicked it off with the Adnan Syed case. And then Undisclosed Pod was a spinoff of that where they've been talking about uh, Adnan's case as well as some others. And then one called Truth and Justice. And they talk a lot about these Brady violations. And so I'm totally up to speed on Brady violations. There's a, so many uh, Brady violations of people and so many people who should not be locked up, innocent people that are behind uh, bars. And it's just right. horrible because... Um, not all, but so many of the prosecutors and uh, they just want their numbers. You know, they, they, and the cops as well, they want their numbers. They, they get their numbers, they get their bonuses, they get their kudos, they get whatever it is they get. In the county I lived in, in Georgia, the sheriff of the county actually got dollars into his checking, um, not checking account, but into his retirement fund every time a ticket was written. So if someone was pulled over for a, um, you know, for speeding and for making a wrong turn or whatever. They got written all these separate tickets because, and, and they had incentive, but they got rewarded by being, you know, by writing more tickets. <laughs> right. Oh no. It is encouraging. Like on both sides of the aisle, there are uh, people in Congress and um, of course the president, the Pope and lots of other people, but they're, they're moving towards, um, you know, reform and that that's really needed. Um, so I think that, um, and it's both parties. So that's very good and heartening. Um, in my personal case, it takes a long time to get things changed. And one of the things I brought up to some experts, I said, why isn't there parole in the federal system? There is in the state system. And it's, it was only, this was a policy was since the eighties in the drug war. Before that, there was parole. If you were, you know, uh, behaved and, and were a good prisoner and, they said, yeah, there's no parole and trying to get that changed. They were very discouraging because I thought, well, oh, yeah. this needs to be changed. And changing things in the government, is, I mean, why? There's not even any, well, I don't know any rationale for it. If it's true in the states, why isn't it true at the federal level for parole? I never hear anybody really talk about it much and I need to look into it more when I get some more free time. But um, it's an issue that I think, you know, that alone would free up a lot of people because there's, you know, perfectly well behaved and older people. That's a whole other issue in the prisons is that people with these long, horrible sentences that are nonviolent, especially they're old. They need medical care. They're on walkers and wheelchairs in prison. Are they really a threat to us? Is that really wow. what we need to do? Paying wow. 100 grand a year per prison or whatever it is. I, I don't know the exact number. It but, is a lot. Uh, a lot. And, uh, it's, it's, it's yeah. like a new big problem in the prisons. Oh my gosh, all these people are old now and they're sick and they're in the medical units. And it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not and a big Obama fan by any people. means, but I have been uh, 
pleased with some of the announcements that he's made. Um, for example, uh, under 18, they can't be held in um, uh, what you said, uh, raw solitary confinement. Oh, right. uh, they were regularly being held. Oh, right, and, right. and one young man was held for a, a, a more than a year in solitary confinement and hadn't even been charged with anything. And uh, he got out when he did get out, he did end up committing suicide. So, I mean, just really tragic, horrible things. Um, and so. It's torture. It's torture, pure and simple. It is. And they've shown Politics. how it impacts people's mental health, where they're damaged psychologically, even when they get out um, permanently. We're not meant to be in that situation. You know, Ross was in there only six weeks, but he said it was, you know, really hard, really horrible. And it's abused. I mean, uh, there's, I think it's, oh gosh, I remember my figures. There are many, many people serving decades in this country in solitary. Decades. And I forget mm. how many, I'm, I can't remember the number, but it's really? a big number. <laughs> Way too big. And mm -hmm. decades. decades. Wow. And that is supposed to be something that is a temporary measure, temporary, however they define it. But it seems like obviously there's real problems with that. And we look at the uh, criminal justice system. We're seeing it now exposed because of what Ross is going through and what you are going through. And again, Len, we are extending support to you and to Ross. And please let him know he's oh, not I will. alone. I will for sure. There's lots of us out here uh, for it. And all those of you watching, this really has become a lightning rod. It's a way to bring focus to a problem with the system, the criminal justice system in the United States that definitely needs some attention. We need to follow the money. When people are incentivized to arrest people, right. hmm, wait a minute, something seems awry with that. And when we see uh, con continued incarceration and prohibition, which we realize does not work, and now we're seeing it again, time to re-examine what that is. It's time for some new discussion. Sure. And Lynn, what you are doing is helping to bring that to Good. light. That's one of my well, goals. We're going to be wrapping up in just a little bit here, mm -hmm. running out of time. But Lynn, any final words, any final statements that you want to leave us with before we mm -hmm. go for those that are watching this both live and then the many that will be watching this on recording? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, um, I, I, I said before, you know, I feel like we're at a crossroads in history right now. Um, we're careening into the digital age. It's all new territory in the courts. And there's some very important cases, and this is one of them, that it's going to determine precedent. And I just ask you for your help. I mean, I, it, it's like uh, if you care about fair trials, if you care about your privacy and Fourth Amendment and your constitutional protections, at least Americans, but worldwide, it impacts people worldwide. We need help. I mean, we can't do this alone. It's just about impossible for a uh, regular family and individuals to fight the U.S. federal government. So we really, I really uh, ask you at least come to freeross.org and read what we have to say, read about the case, and give what you can. Um, the other thing I'm glad you brought up about um, the criminal justice system, because I feel like in a way uh, this is bigger than Ross for me too. I mean, mm -hmm. of course, I, I I keep at it nonstop, for my love for my son and my belief in him. But it's bigger. I mean, I, I feel like I want it to be something that does good, that that is used for good uh, with other people and issues. And, and for those people I see in the prison every week, you know, I feel like I'm speaking for them because, you know, they don't have a high profile case. They don't have the opportunity. They don't have my education. And, and they're not able to speak for themselves in this way. And I really see it as um, our freedoms and the abuse of government. Um, because I'm Ross's mother, people want to hear what I have to say, you know, for now. And um, I feel like it's a real uh, duty almost to um, use that platform. And so I really appreciate mm -hmm. you guys so much for your support and giving me that opportunity and that chance. I will definitely tell Ross. I've already told him I'm going to Freedom Fest and how what a privilege that is and um, what we're going to be doing. So he's very pleased and happy and about it. And he does feel bolstered by knowing that there's other people out there because you can feel very alone in there. You know, he's cut off. He doesn't have email or Internet like other prisoners because it's an Internet crime. And so um, he's very cut mm -hmm. off. And so it's really means a lot to me and to him and our family for you to give us the support. So I really appreciate it. <laughs> 
Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you, Lynn. We are glad to have you here. And for those of you watching, this is the kind of discussion that we need to have. And we'll be doing even more of this at Freedom Fest. And we encourage you to come to an intellectual feast that will be there where you hear a variety wait. of topics from yeah. many po other people. What's that, Lynn? I said, I can't wait. I think it's going to be so exciting. Yeah. I've heard it's, it's really so great. great. Yeah, I've heard it's yes. really amazing. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's a chance to hang around some amazing people that are really smart and you're not going to agree with everyone. That's OK. You get to hear many different points of view on very important topics. And I think that's a real hallmark of why we like to go there. And it's like we wish we could go there and not have to sleep at all. Really, it'd be great. <laughs> There's so much good going on yeah. and all that. But yeah. that's going to be July 13th through 16th. And don't forget to use the code FFTV as in Freedom Fest TV that we're doing right now. And you get $100 off the registration. So that's just between us. Don't tell the grown-ups, okay? So just use that. You'll find that it uh, gets you through and Good you can deal. get a lot of things. Yeah. Gina, before we conclude, no, any just, final uh, words you know, from I'm you? I'm so excited that Lynn's going to be there. That movie that she talked about earlier in the in the episode, she was talking about a, a film that's going to be shown at Freedom Fest, which is going to be really helpful. Web. Dark, what's it called? Dark Web? Deep, Deep web. web. Deep Web. And I know there are um, several films uh, related to the prison system and incarceration. And so I'm very thrilled that we're bringing these points up and that people are going to be able to learn more about, about these different yeah. issues. That's part of why I'm passionate about it. I've learned about it at past Freedom Fests that I've attended. Yeah. So my awareness was has been raised as in many other areas. Uh, there are events about nutrition and events about uh, health and technology and um, the arts, all kinds of things. As Terry said, it's an intellectual feast. We have speakers, Senator Rand Paul, Judge Andrew Napolitano, Steve Forbes, John Mackey, Dinesh D'Souza. I'm sure a lot of you recognize many of these names. George Foreman is going to be there. He's our opening keynote. And we're just going to have a really grand time. And I hope that you can join us. Yes, it's going to be great. And by the way, we also have the information there on the side. You'll see the live chat. Those of you joining us, we can see that. And Lynn, I think you've been watch watching that and you see what's there. Uh, you see the donate to them. We got the freeross.org in there. So you'll great. see that. Great. And uh, other information, any other uh, information, Lynn, that you feel you want to put in there or addresses uh, before we conclude this, you can go ahead and enter those. Gina, anything else that we want to put in? Or those of you that are joining us live, if you have some comments uh, that you want to put in there, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, last chance before we conclude, anyone wishing to join, you just click on that uh, come on in and uh, call in. We'll be able to bring you on here real fast. But if there's no other ones, then we want to thank you very much for joining us. I'm Terry Brock, the MC for Freedom Fest this year and uh, the MC for this Freedom Fest. Yeah, TV. I just wanted Gina, to thank you uh, Kupaki. Kupaki was uh, on last week and he was helping us out with some things. And this week he's donated. So good for you. Let's give him a round of applause. Yay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so yeah, much. I, I, I hope I'm you. saying that properly. We'd be giving some props if we to here. Kupaki, I don't know, but thank you so much. Yes, indeed. And by the way, Lynn, do you notice those numbers there in the lower right corner? This is your first time on Blab. You see in the lower right corner, there's some uh, little um, things. These are props that as you say something and people like it, you can click there and it's like giving a round of applause. So you're up to oh, uh, 200 okay. crossing that and <laughs> getting a lot right now as curve. we move forward. That's what it is. Welcome to the world of Blab. Yeah. And uh, those of you that are wondering, by the way, we're, we have been using Blab from Blab.im, a great tool for communication. So you can send information back and forth, see people on the screen. You'd be able to have the comments live. And also, don't forget, if you would, please share this information. You can share the last 30 seconds on your Twitter account. Click on that, and it will give you the ability to send it out to the people who are following you. And it gets the word out more about right. Freedom Fest and about how people can help Ross. So here's a practical way you can do it. It costs you a click. You click, and it lets people know. And uh, I'm thinking we could do even more. As a matter of fact, Lynn, I might just say, for you, so you're seeing this for the first time, yeah. we might be able to use this again in the future sometime, that you would be able to use it for some way to talk about what's going on. And I hope it oh, just uh, kind of opens some ideas and you go, ooh, maybe we could do that. We could do this. And the cost is zero. So free is free in the budget for you, Lynn? Yeah. 
I like that price. Yeah, so free, yeah. free of the budget is good. And those of you watching this, it's an education. You'll get a chance to use it too. Hey, we're just having so much fun. We want might want to keep going all day. You guys but uh, really we're going to conclude it for really now. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And on behalf of Freedom Fest team, all that are involved there, and myself, Terry Brock, Gina Carr, our producer, and Lynn Ulbrecht. Lynn, thank you very much oh, again you. for joining us today. Thank you. And we thank you for joining us. We will see you next time Take on care. Freedom Thanks, Fest Lynn. TV. Bye-bye. Bye now. Gina.